Welcome back to Hashtag Fish. If you are new to this channel, I'm José Domingos and I am passionate about marine biology and aquaculture. In this channel, I teach all things about fish and shrimp farming. In the last episode, we spoke about the different stages of molting cycle of a shrimp and how we can easily monitor what stage they are by looking at the tip of the Europod. This way we can predict if it's safe to harvest or if they may molt when we start harvesting. In this episode here, we will cover the implications of molting to shrimp feeding. Firstly, for comparison, I want to run through how different animals eat. Specifically, let us compare how we feed terrestrial animal. Then we'll have a look at how we feed fish to finally look more in detail on how shrimp eat. For an example of terrestrial animals, let us have a look on how my beloved and trusty dog Maya eats. Now let us have a look on how a fish eats. And here are two of my favorite fishes, the Australian barramundi and cobia. Here it is my nephew Ian feeding some cobia when I was breeding them in Australia. Agora sim. Mais um? Mais um peixinho? Joga lá. Mais um? And finally, let us have a look at how a shrimp eats. It is so cool, isn't it? I guess you spotted some differences between them, didn't you? Even though some of these differences may seem too obvious to all of us, there are some particular complications about shrimp feeding. With my trusty dog Maya, for instance, if she's hungry, I can easily see if she has eaten everything or if the bowl is empty. Or if she's not so hungry, I will see that she has left some biscuits in her bowl. If for some reason Maya doesn't feel like eating it, the food will stay there in the bowl for quite some time without a problem. She can eat it later, maybe in the next day or two, but perhaps not. It may be a bit soggy, but most of the nutrients would still be in the pellets. Now, with most farm fish, we can use floating pellets and we can monitor how hungry they are by looking at the frenzy they make. If there are leftover pellets on the surface of the water, we just grab a net and scoop them out so they don't spoil the water. So here comes the main differences with farm shrimp that we just don't have with terrestrial animals or even fish. Firstly, shrimp is a benthic organism, which means they primarily live and eat on the bottom. So we must use pellets that sink to the bottom. One additional thing to note though is that shrimp don't grow well in clear water. 
which make it more difficult to figure out what is happening down under and importantly if they are eating or not. The second point is that different than a fish that open their mouths and swallow their food whole and straight down to their stomach, shrimp have to manipulate, cut and crumble their feet into pieces that are tiny enough to enter their mouths. But if they have just molted and have a soft exoskeleton, their muscles don't have the leverage to push and pull when they are soft. So when they are soft, they just don't eat. I think it's easy to understand if we try to put ourselves in their shoes. Imagine that you just happen to lose all your teeth and someone offered you a steak or some crackers or an apple. What would you say? Probably you would say thanks, but no thanks. So trying to feed a soft shrimp or better saying putting food in the water when they have just molted is just a big waste of money because it will just rot in there. The quality of the bottom of the pond and the water where the shrimp live will just deteriorate. Let's imagine for a second if I mix Maya's food with water in her bowl. Leave me a comment below what are your thoughts on how long you think that feed would last. Do you think that Maya would come to eat it later or maybe on the next day? What would happen to that feed in a day or two left in water in a tropical environment where the water is around 30 degrees Celsius? So the potential of uneaten feeds to cause pollution within a farming system is many times greater in aquaculture than in terrestrial livestock. And in shrimp farming, it is just not a potential, it's a reality. So how do we feed them? Now, you may start to realize why we are having this video to help us to all better understand the importance of the relationship between molting and shrimp feeding. I promise we'll have a number of cool videos to specifically talk about shrimp nutrition, feeds and feeding. But for now, let us just focus on the shrimp demand for feed across the different stages of their molting cycle. Bear here with me, subscribe to hashtag fish and hit that bell button to receive notifications when our next videos come out. I'll share with you a cool experiment I did in my master's degree almost 20 years ago, what I learned from it and how I adapted on the several shrimp farms I managed over the course of my career in this industry. In my master's degree, I tested the effects of different quantities of a special type of artificial substrate in semi-intensive shrimp farming. So here are the experimental units I built inside this commercial pond to test these different quantities of substrates. Without veering too much from the topic of this video, I stocked those pens with 3.5 gram shrimp at a density of 30 shrimp per square meter. I fed my shrimp using one feed tray per pen three times a day and I would adjust the feeding quantity according to what they really wanted to eat in about two hours. This is because after two hours immersed in water, there is no more nutrients left in the pellets, so it doesn't matter. If after two hours there was a lot of feed left, I would reduce the quantity, and if there was none feed left, I would increase the quantity. So I would check those trays and try to always have the least amount of feed left there. If I had just a couple of pellets left in the next two hours, then I was happy. In any case, I would remove what was left and weigh it to know exactly how much in fact they had eaten. I made and used those PVC rings to know how many scoops I had given on the day before and how many I gave in each meal on the day to try to gauge on how much they really wanted. I don't think there is a way to measure consumption at such a realistic farm environment as accurate as this and with me checking the feed consumption and leftover three times per day in those 12 pens, I managed to have a 6.5% waste. Before you judge it, let me tell you that the FCR in this experiment ranged from 0.96 to 1.07 kilos of feed per kilos of biomass produced. Please Tell me in the comments below if you know of any livestock farming system that has a more efficient nutrient utilization than what we have in shrimp here or aquaculture in general. I believe that in a well-managed shrimp farm, the waste would be around 10 
to 15%. You will soon see why it's so difficult to have a zero feed waste with shrimp farming as we can have with fish or as I can have with my beloved Maya. So after my shrimp had grown to about 11 grams and me working six days without any break, I ended the experiment. Luckily to me, the pond needed to be harvested. So it was time for me to go low and dirty on the mud and to retrieve all the remaining shrimp that I could not get by trapping and cast netting so that I could evaluate the survival, total biomass and FCR from each of those 12 pens. One of the most interesting thing looking at the data for me was when I plotted the demand for feed by the shrimp. How do you think that this graph looked like? Please let me know if you think it went like this or let me know if it went like this. In fact, it went like this. Yes, the overall consumption goes up over time, but it's not a linear or exponential one. The trend follows an oscillating, synchronized and increasing pattern across the different treatments. There was a voracious increase in appetite for a period of about two days until it reached a plateau and stayed at that plateau of maximum feed demand which lasted about four days until they just did not want to eat any longer all that much and the quantity required dropped by half or even less for a period that follow of about one to three days. Imagine here that if I didn't have feed tray monitoring system with a constant feedback, how much feed and money I would have wasted and how bad the water quality and the pond bottom quality would have been. Of course, these patterns have to do with four main things. Here they are. Number one, the molting cycle. The low consumption is when they have just molted. So they are at stages A and B. When the consumption is rapidly increasing, they are hardening up and they are at stages B and C. And when they are at the peak and the plateau, their exoskeleton is very hard and they are at stages C and D. Number two, the size of the animal. You can see that the more they grew, the plateau increased and the plateaus also got longer. Number three, the temperature of the water. When the water got colder, they ate less. And when it got warmer, they tended to eat more naturally. So there are some periods in feed consumption that are directly related to water temperature. But surprisingly, there were also periods when this did not happen and that puzzled me at first. Finally, what I noticed was that they, when they were abrupt changes in water temperature for more than two to three degrees, due to either some cold fronts or heat waves. When they had been feeding at that plateau, I realized that about 24 hours later, they would be molting and their feed demand would just drop dramatically. So these temperature changes either to more or less when they are hard and feeding at the maximum, it will trigger a mass molting event. When feeding shrimp, we need to be beyond waiters in a restaurant. We in fact need to be like a breastfeeding mother. Yes, my friends, shrimp is a very demanding business. If they have a hard shell on and are hungry, we must give them what they ask for. If not, we're just holding them back from fully expressing their growth potential and increasing the time of the duration of the culture cycle. This is what our farmers are supposed to do, to let them grow. On the other hand, if they molt it and just don't want to eat, we must hold off. Otherwise, we are just wasting expensive feed, polluting the waters and causing a mess. So how do we do that? We need to monitor their appetite and feed consumption very closely with the use of feed trays and keeping up with their demand on a real-time graphical view system, not just a mere table on a clipboard because it may be too slow to increase to the previous plateau level when they have already hardened or it may be too slow to cut the feedback but most importantly you need to have someone very passionate about shrimp looking after them and their feeding like i said we'll have a few cool videos about shrimp nutrition feeds and feeding coming up where i'll go through the different ways we can do that in a commercial farm not to waste any feed have them growing at their maximum and reaching the lowest fcr 
possible. I'll be talking from my own experience of being responsible for the production of over three and a half thousand tons of export quality shrimp. To wrap this up, in this video we cover the implications of molting to shrimp feeding and growth, in particular on how their appetite will change according to what stage they are in the molting cycle. This is something we have to be very aware if you intend to be in this shrimp farming business because it is dramatically different from fish farming or terrestrial livestock farming. So if you learned something today, please like this video and let me know in the comments if you have any questions or suggestions and I'll read and reply to each one of them. Thank you for being here with me at Hashtag Fish.